next on Unsolved Mysteries. A woman is found dead on a lonely country road. Was she the victim of an accident? Or is her husband guilty of murder? Witnesses say a woman can produce gold foil from her pores. Is she a gifted psychic or a brilliant fraud? Two televangelists receive similar packages from a would-be assassin, and both contain bombs. And a rare, often incurable disease strikes a teenage girl. Can belief in the power of prayer bring about a miracle cure? Five compelling cases. I'm Dennis Farina, and this is Unsolved Mysteries. Join us, won't you? Point, Virginia. One September night, a pickup truck is discovered on a back road. The engine is running, the keys are in the ignition, and the transmission is in park. Beside the truck, its owner, Kay Hall, has been crushed to death. Whoever operated the vehicle appeared to have backed over the center of her torso and probably on the bump from rolling over her with the left rear tire of the truck, then applied the brake suddenly, causing the vehicle to skid going backwards. The front tire, the left front tire, then caught her torso and pulled her backwards slightly and twisted her body on the roadway, which is how she was found, with the vehicle in park and the engine still running. From the beginning of the investigation, police suspected that Kay's husband, Bob, had murdered her. They believed that the motive was the $50,000 that Kay inherited the same day that she died. All I perceive is that the investigation has focused only on me and that I don't see any effort on anyone's part to look into the other possibilities. Kay Hall was in the insurance business until she left her career to start an oyster farm with Bob. They had been married for two years, though Kay had known Bob for more than 10. The two became involved while Bob was in jail for selling drugs. She wrote to him while he was in prison, and when he was released, Kay was waiting. It was quite an experience that Saturday morning, Kay pulled up in her little Fiesta, and I could see the car way off in the distance and her waving at me. And between us was a very large electrical fence. And she very laughingly said to me, hey, you, Robert, I finally got you at last. And that was a, that was a good feeling. It was nice to feel wanted by somebody. Kay was definitely a rehabilitator. And I think maybe that's how it started. But certainly with Bob, she took pity on him. When she picked him up from prison, he had the shirt on his back. She brought him home to live with her. She fed him, clothed him. They went immediately out and got a new wardrobe. He had difficulty finding a job, so she just supported him. Six months after the couple started their business, they were facing financial ruin. There was tension in the marriage, and both began to drink heavily. As time went on, I'd ask her, how's the business going? And I can tell it wasn't going so well. And then I'd say, well, and how's Bob? And I could tell that wasn't so good either. Well, it's about time, dear. Friends say that Kay and Bob often argued, even over trivial things. We're taking the truck. Why? Why can't we take the Jeep? Because you got the DWI in the Jeep. Kay called me, and she started crying. And she said, Bob is abusing me physically. He's abusing me. He beats me up. And that's when she started to talk about going into therapy, trying to get into marriage, counseling with Bob. And if that didn't work, that she would definitely consider divorce. Conversation about divorce uh, 
probably came up as frequently as it would in any uh, couple's relationship where there were problems, and the problems were essentially money. The, the oyster business had not treated us with great kindness. We had lost an awful lot of money on it. Hi. Hi, Kay. But Kay had some promise of financial relief. She had recently inherited $50,000. On the day of her death, she transferred half of the money into her account. That evening, Kay and Bob went to a party at the local country club. We got to the party probably around 20 after 6, and Kay was, I know, was thoroughly enjoying herself. You could just see the magic, you know. Kay walked in, and then all of these faces just seemed to turn. There's Kay, and all of a sudden, things seemed to be complete. As the evening went on, Kay and Bob continued to drink. You ready to go home? Just a couple minutes. Having a good Thanks. time? Well, not as good as you. During the evening, Kay became upset. Some say because of the amount that Bob tipped the bartender. She left without her husband and drove away in their pickup. A few minutes later, Bob was driven home by friends. About two hours later, guests leaving a different dinner party came upon a shocking scene. There was a truck sitting there off to the side of the road with the lights on, and there was a body underneath the front wheel. We felt her pulse to see whether she had a pulse. We couldn't find one, but that was when we discovered that she was just as warm as you and I are right now. So what had happened had just happened very, very recently. When the paramedics arrived, it was too late. Kay Hall was pronounced dead. Yeah. The reconstruction from witnesses at the scene was that she had been found under the left front tire of her own vehicle. Apparently, the vehicle had backed over her while she was lying on the road. There were some signs, which we later found in the truck, that indicated there was a scuffle inside the cab of the truck. But Kay's purse was still intact. It had all her money and credit cards and so forth in it. The autopsy results showed that she was intoxicated at the time of her death, a rather high level. She very well could be, have been disoriented, which would have caused her to have taken the wrong turn and might have put her in the area where she was found. I think that she probably told Bob that she wanted to divorce him and that she was very serious about it. She had enough money now to really kick him out and do it. And he probably went into one of his drunken rages, which he was well known for amongst her friends and family. And I think that what he saw was his meal ticket walking out the door. If Bob Hall did murder his wife, it could only have happened between the times friends dropped him off at home, about 8.45, and the time that he placed a phone call from his house at 9.47. And for those 62 minutes, Bob Hall had no alibi. Shortly after 8 p.m., Kay left the country club located here. Bob was dropped off at his home here, 15 miles from the club, at 8.45 p.m. Just over an hour later, at about 9.55 p.m., Kay was found dead here, just two miles from the club. Bob Hall had only one hour to drive to the murder site, find his wife, kill her, and then race back home in time to place his 9.47 p.m. phone call. Special Agent Riley retraced the drive from the Hall home to the crime scene several times. I measured the distance between the Hall residence and the spot where Kay was found. The distance is between 14 and 15 miles. I could drive it in as little as 17 minutes if I drove it in a pursuit fashion, and if I drove at a leisurely pace, it took as much as 24 minutes. If Bob left home immediately at 8.45 and drove directly to where Kay's body was found, he would have arrived at 9.05. In order to make his 947 phone call, Hall had to leave the scene no later than 930. This would give him no more than 25 minutes to track down and murder his wife. 
It's terrible to have somebody take it from you in this way, and particularly when nobody has been able to do anything about it. So I really, I don't know that, that I can rest until we, until we see justice served and the murderer is apprehended and convicted. They apparently do not have anyone else to, uh, to focus in on. And being put in that spotlight has been tough. I love Kay. I'm looking forward to this whole incident being resolved. Uh, I'd like to see Kay to literally be put at rest and uh, have some peace in my life and uh, in her family's life. Update. Three years after Kay Hall's death, Robert Hall was convicted of killing her and sentenced to 20 years in prison. A year and a half later, he appealed the conviction and was granted a second trial. The judge shortened his sentence to time served in exchange for Hall's guilty plea to second degree murder. He was given 15 years probation and released from prison. Next, a male bomber targets televangelist Pat Robertson. Virginia Beach, Virginia. Now, that's why this thing is so important. They're one flesh. God said, I hate divorce. Televangelist Pat Robertson's daily broadcast over CBN the Christian Broadcasting Network are seen in nearly a million households nationwide. But his outspoken views on controversial issues have made him the target of hate mail and death threats. Robertson's broadcasts originate from his 685 acre headquarters. Each day, thousands of letters and packages arrive at the CBN mailroom, most of them donations from viewers. But one April day, Scott Sheepers, a CBN security guard, was called to the mailroom to check a package addressed to Pat Robertson. When I looked at the package on the monitor of the x-ray machine, I didn't see anything that was that led me to believe that it was there was a problem or it was really suspicious. Sheepers decided to carefully check the contents of the package. He found several strips of newspaper sticking out of the box. I was still somewhat skeptical about it, um, so I, I stepped away from the box as far as I could get and took my left hand and extended it out and grabbed the lid of the box. I was immediately knocked to the floor. Um, I had severe pain in the upper part of my left leg, in my abdomen, over to my right leg. I made the determination that this is it. You know, it's either lay here and possibly die or get up and get help. And uh, so that's when I made the determination to help myself and pick myself off the floor and try to get to the front of the building. Sheepers was rushed to a nearby hospital where he underwent emergency surgery to remove shrapnel from his leg. I'm very fortunate. The trauma room doctor said if I'd have been holding the package and I had the same size hole in my chest that I have in my leg, um, I might not have even made it out of the room itself. So, uh, yeah, I consider myself very, very fortunate that it wasn't any worse than it was. Authorities determined that the package contained a homemade pipe bomb. They quickly linked the bomb to an earlier attack aimed at another televangelist in Houston, Texas. When it was founded by Pastor John Osteen, the Lakewood Church was one of the largest in America. It could seat more than 8,000 worshipers. Peter, who is this? He said to Jesus, thou art the Christ, the Son of Like Robertson, Pastor Osteen used television to spread the gospel. And he was also the target of a similar male bomb. Who is this, you demons? Speak! Three months before the CBN bombing, John Osteen's daughter, Lisa, arrived at her office to open the day's mail. 
I felt like it was safe to open the package because I, I open a lot of packages as we've never had any problems and this looked like an ordinary package. It had a, a label uh, addressed to my dad, type written to my dad, and then it had a return address and you know, you don't, you're not really suspicious of things like that. It was just a cardboard box and it had a, one piece of tape on it. I opened the box when I was sitting down, and really the next thing I remember is I was standing about five feet away from my chair, and I was very shaken as if I'd had an electrical shock. I'll never forget that feeling. Lisa had been the victim of a pipe bomb wrapped in newspaper. She suffered third degree burns and cuts on her right leg and stomach, but she recovered quickly and just four weeks later, returned to the pulp. I said, I'm alive and well, thank God. Thank God. The box that was used to, to mail this, this device was a box used by home, home sales distributors for the distribution of candles. And there was some printed material on the outside of the box, which had been scratched out with the word burgundy written on the box. We found that both of these packages were mailed from small towns near Fayetteville, North Carolina. The National Center for the Analysis of Violent Crimes researched all the evidence in both the bombing cases. They said, number one, that this individual responsible for the bombings had some type of stress or turmoil in his life at the time of the bombings. Secondly, they felt that anyone around or in the presence of the bomber would have known a, a difference in this person's behavior. These two composites depict the men who were seen mailing the bombs. The drawings were made three months apart by two different police artists, but authorities believe they're the same man. He's described as a neatly dressed white male with brown hair. He's 5'10 to six feet tall with an average build and weighs between 160 and 175 pounds. Both bombs were mailed within 25 miles of Fayetteville, North Carolina. The U.S. Postal Inspector is offering a reward of up to $50,000 in this case. If you have any information, please log on to our website at unsolved.com. Next, a young woman develops a nerve disease so painful that it drives some patients to suicide. But her parents believe that prayer will cure her. Phoenix, Arizona. One Christmas Eve, 14-year-old Trisha Zemba saddled up her ex-racehorse, Sly, and headed out for a ride. But the horse began galloping wildly. Trisha was powerless to stop it. When I fell, I hurt very much, but I was in shock. I had so much adrenaline rushing through my system that what had just happened did not register with me at the moment. I helped her into the house. She was limping a little bit, and uh, took her in and took everything off to look for broken bones, and she was scraped on the one side. The injuries appeared superficial. Trisha improved overnight, and the accident barely affected the family's Christmas Day plans. I got up, got myself dressed, came out, and basically spent all Christmas Day on the couch. I was sore, stiff, hobbled around some, but I was able to get around. It all seemed like a thing of the past until Trisha was bathing 10 days later. I remember I went to get up, and when I was standing up, I started feeling dizzy. I heard a thump, and I called out to her, and she didn't answer me. I was panicked when I saw Trisha passed out. I didn't know what had happened. I couldn't get a response out of her at first. I, I, I just didn't know what was going on. 
from there on, then she her condition seemed to get worse. Uh, pain increased, uh, her mobility you know, started to be less, she had more trouble getting around and sitting. So that's when we started taking her to a round of doctors. The bathtub fall triggered severe pain that the doctors could not diagnose or treat. After five weeks of agony, Trisha was hospitalized. She was in a lot of pain, so they started administering morphine. And they just kept giving it to her and giving it to her in large doses, and it wouldn't affect the pain. It does not help the pain at all. And finally, they had given her so much, they couldn't give her anymore without killing her. It was horrible seeing Trisha in this pain and not being able to do anything for her. And it was very, very scary until we would pray. Dear Jesus, we would just ask, Father, that you would reach down and lay your Trisha hand suffered hand. constant and intense pain. Finally, doctors diagnosed Trisha with a rare nerve disease called reflex sympathetic dystrophy, or RSD. This is by far the worst I had ever seen. And I was feeling pretty hopeless about her chances of getting any kind of a good recovery here. And I remember her mother being so strong in their faith, saying, we're going to see a miracle here before this is over. And I kept thinking, no, I don't think so. This videotape of Trisha was made at the hospital. Doctors believe RSD is produced by malfunctioning nerve circuits. The nerves endlessly amplify and re-amplify pain, making even minor injuries horribly painful. She was literally writhing in pain, unable to have anybody touch or move her leg, her hip. If you even breathed on it or put a blanket over the skin, uh, she would just uh, jump. We continually gave her medication to try and basically numb her legs, the idea being that if we break the cycle, kill the pain, stop the cycle of pain from renegotiating itself, that the condition itself would disappear. <laughs> Doctors injected the most potent pain-killing drugs available directly into Trisha's spinal column, but she hardly noticed. The RSD got worse instead of better, and Trisha's muscles began to weaken. They started telling us that they were going to have to institutionalize her, that most patients with RSD this bad either die from it or they commit suicide or, or they literally go crazy because they cannot live with this type of pain. Despite the doctor's predictions, Trisha's parents never lost faith. Many times, each and every day, they prayed. Grant her some peace and take away this pain. We would pray. And again, that sense that things would be all right would come over us. Though Trisha would still be moaning and our circumstances didn't change, it was like things were all right. Trisha's doctors were not as optimistic. They suggested an operation usually reserved for terminal cancer patients, implanting a morphine pump into Trisha's body. If it dulled her pain, they could at least try physical therapy to slow the breakdown of her leg muscles. That was our next step. That was really all what we had left to offer her. And quite frankly, what I foresaw was a long, painful route in rehab and with a very uncertain outcome as to whether this would ever resolve. Trisha was scheduled for surgery, and then something unexpected happened. I felt the pain, and then my body moved down. And then finally, I felt it move all the way down my leg, and I felt it exit through my toes. I felt it leave my body. And I heard very, very quietly, almost to the point where I couldn't hear it, get up. And I remember thinking, I can't get up. My, I'm physically unable to get up. And I heard, again, clear and more, a much more authoritative, get up. And I remember grabbing onto the side of the bed rail and beginning to sit up. And I was able to sit up like I would have in the past. I sat up and I was sitting on the edge of the bed. And the second I set my feet on the ground, I didn't have any pain anywhere in my whole body. I stood up and I remember I was standing there like, well, what now? <laughs> and I started walking. 
It was unbelievable to walk into her hospital room and see her standing there. She hadn't stood for two and a half months on her own. Um, tremendous relief and gratitude to God, who never let us down. As a medical physician, I have to go by the medical data. And the medical data has no explanation for this. On a purely personal basis, and based on my own religious beliefs, I feel that yes, she did have a miraculous healing. That very same morning, Trisha was released from the hospital. Her parents made this videotape soon after she arrived home. I know it was a miracle. The pain just left my body in one fell swoop. I felt like God was standing there, right there, just taking this pain from me and saying, you know, I love you so much, I just want to set you free. Spontaneous remission is virtually unheard of in acute cases of RSD. Medical science still has no explanation for Trisha's amazing recovery. But for Trisha and her family, there's no mystery at all. They thank God for her recovery. Next, meet a woman who seems to perform bizarre psychic feats that defy explanation. You're about to meet a woman named Katie. According to eyewitnesses, she can predict the future and produce objects out of thin air. Is Katie a gifted psychic or just a talented magician? You be the judge. I'll see people that ain't there. You know, I hear voices that no one else hears. Objects coming from eyes, ears, nose, mouth, you know, just popping out. Katie is a great classical physical medium, a psychic who has the ability, or apparently the ability is a gift, which she has, where things happen which are unexplainable, physical things, mind over matter, seeds germinating, things moving without reason, things appearing and disappearing, and all kinds of prophecy, all kinds of things, both mental and physical phenomena. I view myself as very skeptical when it comes to psychics. So. I view myself as very skeptical anyway. Uh, if I can't see something that's uh, quite tangible, I, I just don't believe it. And uh, in this particular case, we've seen some, uh, some things that were uh, quite astounding that uh, I can't explain. Before his retirement from the police department, Jerry Burr had asked for Katie's help with several cases. In one burglary investigation, he didn't tell Katie the location of the crime scene. He wanted her to find it. That's it. That's the house. This is the house here? Burr says Katie not only located the house, but she also said that artworks inside were Asian in style. She also said that something had been stolen from a box in a blue room. As we walked in in the entryway, it was all Oriental art. Uh, walked into the room, that the, the bedroom that the items were taken from, and it turned out the bedroom was blue as well. Uh, she had said it was taken from a box, and sure enough, the items that were taken were from a cherry wood box. Um, didn't know what to think at first. Uh, because she was so dead on, and because I am quite skeptical, I started looking at Katie as a good suspect. Uh, I just wasn't aware that, uh, you know, she was that good. So was Katie's prediction a true display of psychic powers, or just a lucky guess? The psychics make general predictions, and it's difficult to confirm them. I don't think, on the basis of what I've seen, that Miss Katie has any special powers. Seems like it's coming out of my face a lot. Stick your tongue out, please. Katie's abilities seem to go beyond the psychic realm. She's also been videotaped by her psychiatrist, sweating what appears to be gold foil out of the pores of her skin. It comes out all over my body, face, eyes, Ears, mouth, arms, thighs, tummy, back, wherever I got to pores, this is where it comes out at. It's getting larger, it seems to me. Katie has supposedly produced the foil more than 100 times. Psychiatrist Berthold Schwartz has examined her during some of these episodes. Miss Katie has the ability, apparently, of having a metallic, gold-like metal foil form on her body and sometimes on objects nearby. For example, a 
framed picture of her late mother, and this gold-like foil will appear on the borders of the picture, on the frame. More likely, the gold, we're using the words loosely, will appear on her cheeks, under the eyes, the abdomen, the forearms. Here we have something which is a medical marvel. I saw the gold on her tongue first. As Dr. Schwartz was taking the gold off, he had to actually peel it off with a, a tweezer-like instrument. And then I looked down at her arm, and I was holding her hand. And there was nothing on her arm at all. And then she had these long strips of gold that resembled candy kiss uh, wrapping. As we were sitting in a room with Katie, uh, Katie had picked up the front of her blouse, and gold flakes were covering her entire stomach area. And after it was brushed off with her shirt still in the open position, more gold flakes appeared. Eyewitnesses insist that these incidents were not faked and that the gold foil appeared before their eyes. A laboratory analysis of the material shows it to be 80% copper and 20% zinc. I don't think there's any objective hard evidence that this is uh, exuding from her pores. More, more, most likely, point is someone wants other people to believe this, and so they put this metallic paper on them. Two of Professor Kurtz's colleagues were able to simulate Katie's alleged abilities using ordinary metallic foil. Okay, so this is what we did. We went to a regular art store in Buffalo. We bought something called gold leafing. It's very thin strips of foil colored gold. The chemical and, uh, composition of the foil closely resembles that of Katie's foil. The foil on in thin strips, Kathy helped me. And then I sprayed hairspray on it so it would stick and it's been stuck for four hours since 11 this morning. And I have some on my tongue and I can still talk and swallow sometimes. <laughs> and then I put it on my stomach. And then I put it on my back. If somebody come up to me and said, well, hey, I know this person that's got the stuff that comes out of their skin, you know, it's gold. You know, I really have seen this. I would think it was a trick. Until I seen it myself, I would, I would believe that it, you know, well, what are they doing? I'm, I'm here, Kate. I put the hair out of the way. <laughs> Even more unbelievable is Katie's apparent ability to produce solid objects out of her mouth, nose, or ears. This videotape, taken by her psychiatrist, shows what appears to be a gold charm emerging from the area around her ear. This tape was also shot by Dr. Schwartz and shows a glass stone apparently falling out of Katie's eye. It might look as though she's going to throw up. Out pops a gem of some kind right out of the mouth. Now, prior to that, the mouth and throat was examined very carefully. There was nothing there. She sipped some water and swallowed, so nothing was secreted, which it's hard to see how it could be anyway in the stomach. So you have to ask the question, where did this thing come from? Are these objects being produced by a skillful sleight of hand? This footage has been slowed down to take a closer look. In these frames, we can actually see the object emerge from above her ring. I assume that at the point when she actually caused the gem to appear, she had the, the gem palmed in her hand, just like this, palmed between her fingers. It's a very comfortable place, and you can gesture convenient, comfortably, and nobody uh, suspects anything. And then when she reached her hand up to her eye, it was a simple matter to spread her fingers apart. And you can see them spreading apart as the gem falls through like that is Katie a talented fraud if so it seems odd that she has never tried to profit in any way from her abilities where does something like this fit into my thinking it doesn't it's a it's beyond me it's beyond my comprehension I was a doubting Thomas too but um, if you saw it you too would be a believer I've learned to accept it a little bit more now than what I did in the beginning. But I do still have questions in my mind that are not answered yet. And I don't know if they will be answered. But I'm gonna keep trying until I find out. 
Next, two close friends who were each adopted as infants make a startling discovery. Los Angeles, California. Barbara Smith was only five years old when she had a childhood experience that changed her life forever. Anyway, and your own mother didn't want you. That's why she gave you up. My mother told me so. I just started to run home and I just burst out into tears. That's when it rang clear to me that it could be used in a very vicious, hurtful way. Someone had given me up, even though I had known the security and love of my own family. It was a time of, well, what happened? What really did happen? And I guess it was the first of the real feelings of what it meant to be adopted. Barbara knew that she had been adopted, but it wasn't until she was a teenager that her father allowed her to see her adoption papers. For the first time, she learned that her birth mother's name was Victoria Baumgartner. And I remember seeing my mother's signature on the paper, and I just stared at it and stared at it and stared at it. I just, it was the only thing that I knew that she was in existence. And it sort of, at that point, resurged in myself saying, I know that they're out there. I don't know who or what, but something is out there. In 1957, Barbara met a man named Steve Reed, and they soon fell in love. Hey, come on in. One afternoon, Steve introduced Barbara to a friend of his named Hi Ratner. Barbara was startled by a portrait hanging in his living room. Wow, that portrait looks almost like me. Yeah, that's my sister Barb. Remember I told you how much you guys looked alike? Oh, that's right, you did mention that. Yeah. No, you're gonna meet her. I looked at that portrait and I thought, well, he's right. She does resemble me. How interesting. Oh, no. Then we assembled into the dining room, and Barbara came in, and just Barbara. we briefly Hi. were introduced and said you? hello. Good. How are you doing? OK, I'd like you to meet my fiance, Barbara. Hi. <laughs> and I thought, she does look you know, a lot like me, and just kind of thought that to myself. We met, um, and it was just instant-like. You know how sometimes you meet somebody and you feel like you've known them for a long time? The two Barbaras became instant best friends. They were even married to two men who were also best friends. Our friendship developed almost instantly. We really became very close. We shared a lot of our life's events. Having children, we raised our children together to the point that Barbara was Aunt Barbara and I was Aunt Barbara for her children. Barbara never knew that she was adopted. And I had been told that she was adopted. So it was a, a thing that I knew, never talk about it. But I talked about it from my point of view later on. I told her that I was adopted in the name of my mother. And what I knew, she just asked a couple of questions and that was it. And nothing more was ever thought about it until her mother passed away. After her mother's death, Barbara Ratner found a box containing some old family documents. Among them were papers revealing that she had also been adopted. And like Barbara Smith, Barbara Ratner's birth mother had the name Bumgarner. I was dumbfounded. I didn't know that I was adopted, but I didn't connect it with Barbara at that moment. It was a few minutes later when I started reading the correspondence and there was one paragraph where they were describing the mother as being a healthy woman, already having one previous child, a daughter, living in Beverly Hills that was um, in very good health. I just knew it was Barbara. I just knew. Hello? Barbara Ratner immediately oh, called Barbara. Barbara Smith. What was your natural mother's name again? Victoria Bumgarner. And I said, well, you're not going to believe this. <laughs> I said, uh, I just found some papers, and I am baby girl Bumgarner. And I, there was a long pause, and then she said, I'll get back to you, and hung up. 
Barbara Smith called her adopted parents. Her father agreed to call the doctor who had arranged the adoption. He confirmed that the two Barbers were indeed sisters. It was just the most wonderful thing to me. I mean, your best friend is your sister, and that couldn't be more wonderful. I mean, we were already Annie Barber, and I remember running into her children at one point and said, but I'm really Annie Barber, but I'm really Annie Barber. And they looked at me and thought, what is she talking about? <laughs> The two Barbaras contacted the Children's Home Society of California. They found out that in 1940, a pregnant and unmarried 23-year-old woman named Victoria Bumgarner arrived in Los Angeles. She had turned to Dr. Maurice Silton for help. Having any discomfort? On July 31st, a baby girl was born. She was adopted by Jack and Rose Smith, who named her Barbara Ann. 15 months later, Victoria gave birth to a second daughter who was also given up for adoption. Against all odds, the two young sisters ended up living just five miles apart. Each was named Barbara Ann, and each was raised by an adoptive mother named Rose. As we started to compare some of the, the facts and the dates, and it was just a lot of similarities. Even some of our outfits as children were similar. I mean, it's, I don't think a lot of twins have as much similarities as we do. Um, and the fact that we married best friends and the fact that we are best friends, mm -hmm. you know, it's just a uh, real, <laughs> that just goes on. <laughs> With the sisters reunited, their greatest wish was to find their birth mother. Update. As a result of this broadcast, the two Barbaras found their mother. Because she had never told her family that she had given birth to two babies out of wedlock, their mother did not allow us to film the reunion. Both Barbaras were thrilled to locate her and to share their unusual story of friendship. <laughs>